Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and I have returned to the somewhat high altitudes to determine why it is that radiation seems to go down as you start going up but then go back up again as you keep going up. Well, you get the idea. Join me for the discovery. Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and yes, I am taking off in an airplane with a detector. Notice that the detector says 0.04 microsieverts per hour. Now I'm going to go up in altitude, and you're probably going to think to yourself, well, my reading should go up in altitude with me, right? Because the higher you go up, the less air there is. The less air, the more cosmic background you get, right? But wrong, it's actually going down. Notice that it's now at 0 0.02, 0 0.01, and it will stay here for a little while. I went on four airplane flights to try to figure out why this is actually happening and I'm about to go on four more of them and I'm going to keep bringing my equi equipment with me and taking readings because I want to know about this interesting little sweet spot I've discovered. From what I can tell, it appears that radiation actually drops and then goes back up again with respect to altitude and I think I have an idea of why. Now sorry the video didn't come out very well. I figured with my next four flights I might be able to get at least one good set of video. See that we're down to one one hundredth of a microsievert per hour and we're at maybe two thousand feet, maybe three thousand feet in climbing. And um, <clears throat> watch what happens in just a few seconds here. This was actually surprising. Wait for it. Right around now is when it should happen. There, zero. Now, that's not actually no radiation whatsoever. It's not zero, but it's below the, d the detection limits on my actual detector. I was absolutely surprised by this. I couldn't believe it. Look at the altitude. We're at about maybe 4,000, 5,000 feet, about a mile up, a, c a couple of kilometers, and we're rising. Now, I'm going to show you uh, my, my Geiger counter as well. I actually took the Geiger counter along with me as well, the Inspector USB. And the Inspector USB did the same thing as the Geiger counter. A little bit different. I mean, there's differences in thresholds of when they go up and down. For the most part, we take off, and once we hit three or 4,000 feet, radiation starts dropping. And once we get to about ten to 15,000 feet, it starts going up again. I found this absolutely amazing. And uh, it continues all the way up until you get to 30, uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 microsieverts per hour. So nearly a half a micro microsievert per hour is how high it will go. You see it's already climbing back up again. I found that absolutely bizarre. Now let's stop and let's have a look at some of the data. We are always told that as we go up, cosmic radiation causes our background to go up. We get higher and higher counts per minute, microsieverts per hour, that sort of thing. But I decided to check it out and see if I could figure out what this little area, this zone of low activity was. Using both of my detectors on all four flights, I measured going up, going down, where the sweet spot, the sweet spot began and where it ended. Um, I don't have an altimeter, so I had to do things like uh, asking the captain of the airplane at what time they hit a certain altitude and a lot of eyeballing. So there's some unscientific aspects to what I'm doing. I can see, as you can see, at 32,000 feet, my average readings are approximately 0 0.33 uh, microsieverts per hour and 600 counts per minute. All right, so my Geiger counter had um, this is an inspector USB has its data logging running and had data logging running on my uh, Polymaster too. Unfortunately and regrettably, my Polymaster screwed up and deleted its own history. I've seen it do this a few times before. It's really annoying. It's a bug, and I've reported it and not gotten anything fixed about it, so I'm kind of angry about that. But it looks like the inspector came through for me. The inspector was logging in 10-minute increments, and I should set that for, ne for the next couple flights I take to one-minute increments so that I get a nice smooth up and down with altitude as opposed to what I have here, which are these kind of pillars which are caused by 10-minute readings. Anyhow, I turned them into a graph. The software can do it too, but it works a little better like this. And I would recommend, um, if you want a nice graph, running it through a Geiger graph, which is radiationnetwork.com, or if you're like me, I just do it myself like this. But you can see the first flight that I took, we went up to as high as 800 counts per minute. 
a second flight with the same altitude but lower. And the reason is, and this is the part I'm not 100% sure on, this is like a secondary thing I discovered. This was taken in, um, in the early morning before the sun came up, and this was right after the sun had come up. It was kind of like actually maybe midday or so. So it seemed to me that the readings were higher at night than they were during the day. And that makes sense because the, the sun would do a reasonably good job of blocking cosmic background. And solar radiation, as much as there is that comes out of the sun, is actually lower in ener energy overall than cosmic background. Uh, but then again, I, I don't have any real proof for that yet. So that's another experiment to do while I'm on my next set of flights. So let me move over here. This last one was the one I took in the, at night. The last flight I took that was l much, much, much later at night. You notice how much higher it is. But it was also at a higher altitude. This one was at 39,000 feet, where the other ones were at 32. And that, that extra a few thousand feet could have made a particularly huge difference. So this doesn't prove anything, but it gives me an idea of how to make my next set of tests correct so that I can prove something. Because one of the important things in life is that not, not this that you own up to the fact that you either make mistakes or do not do things correctly, but that you also learn from them and then try to make them better, which is what's really important. And here's a mistake I made. The unit was cut off for my flight, which should be right here. I had the unit cut off. And the reason I did that is because when I go through the uh, security checkpoint, they don't care that I have a Geiger counter, but if I have it on and flashing lights and freaking out and setting off alarms and stuff, that probably would bother them. So I usually just cut it off. Otherwise, they don't seem to care. I put it right out in the middle of the open for them to look at, and they just wave me on through. So, you know, whatever. Um, all right, let's switch over to the gamma spectrum that I took here. I took several, in fact. Here are gamma spectrums from five different uh, times. There are four flights. For starters, the highest one, this maroon colored one, was the very final one I took, the highest altitude one. These um, other ones are also from high altitude ones as well. And for me, I'm defining high altitude as being uh, 32,000 feet for these guys, the blue and the green and 39,000 feet for the um, maroon, which is not actually high altitude. High altitude is like, you know, 150,000 feet, that sort of thing. Uh, but it is above our normal Earth altitude. So anyhow, you'll notice that these have a significantly obvious 511 kiloelectron volt peak right here. That is caused um, on the ground where I am right now, that would be an indicator of a pretty powerful... Uh, beta beta positive decay nucleides sitting around, like somebody left a sodium-22 sample sitting out or something. Whereas when you're in the high altitude like this, it's actually indicative of high energy photons from space, from the sun, from whatever. And you can also see that everything here is pretty flat and there's not very much norm. You don't see the peaks that you get associated with naturally occurring radiation from the ground here. Um, you do see a buildup over here of the higher energies, which the machine runs out of its ability to see them, but the higher ener energy stuff should be shown up here. Uh, energies as high as 10 to 20 million electron volts should be showing up. So I thought to myself, well, what about the sweet spot? What would happen if I took a spectrum from about 2,000 feet to about 6,000 feet? That's a short period of time. The airplane climbs pretty fast. What would it look like? What is in that area? Here it is. You see the orange? That's that exact spectrum I just said. You'll notice that it does have the beginnings of that 511 keV spectrum, see, or the, not spectrum, but peak, the, the high energy photon peak, but also has some buildup here from norm. This is naturally occurring radioactive material, like uh, uranium, thorium, potassium, that sort of thing. Well, not potassium right here, but in general, uh, that would be one of them. And you see it building up right here. Um, at about 6,000 feet, I, took, I stopped the spectrum, and then I saved it, and then I continued the spectrum. So this is actually a continuation of the same spectrum. That's the yellow. You notice that this and this are the same spectrum. But the reason that this kind of drops off here is partially due to recalibration, but also to do with the fact that this goes away. It gets mostly overrun by this stuff, these choppy random summings and things that are from high energy particles. What that tells you is that as you're going up, that norm is the norm from the ground is stopping its effect and it's being replaced by cosmic. Now let's go look at the actual spectrum itself. This right here is on the ground, okay? Here's on the ground. This is just a detector sitting right on the ground for over an hour, in fact. You'll notice the biggest thing you see here is a potassium-40 
uh, peaks, the big potassium 40 peak. If we switch to linear view, you can see a little bit coming here from, this is probably thorium most likely. Well, not directly thorium, but a daughter of thorium. Yeah, that's pretty much what it looks like we have going on here. It could be, could be uranium. It's hard to say. I'd have to go in there and double check every one of these guys. The point is it's naturally occurring radioactive material. You don't see anything over on this side. Even in logarithmic view, you don't see anything over here in the higher energies. And 511 shouldn't be too potent either. Let's have a look. Here's 511 KAB, and you don't really see a major peak forming there at all. Whereas, if we take one of the airplane flights, let's say Texas to, where is it? Texas to um, uh, Washington, D.C., it's completely different. In the same period of time, almost exactly, that one's only 100 seconds more, this one's 100 seconds less, you see that all of a sudden the 511 KV range has a big peak on it, all that norm is gone, and even the potassium, you barely see the potassium. There's a little bit of it, probably from the people in the airplane, but that's it. And then a the big buildup over here. So these different spectrum re well, spectra really, really, really show off what I'm trying to Perhaps this say. Will show off a little bit better of what I'm talking about. And I know this is really corny looking, but I drew this myself. You can tell I, I suck. I'm not an artist. But here's our happy sun and cosmic background up here. Here's the ground with the big uranium chunk right here and some other material. And then here's my airplane. Now we have radiation from the ground. See the radiation from the ground? As it goes up, <clears throat> emanating from everything you can imagine on the ground, it slowly gets uh, uh, attenuated by the air. It slows down, it, it lowers its energy, that sort of thing. And within about 2,000 feet or so, it's gone, according to my calculations. I calculated how, how fast uh, potassium-40 uh, um, gammas would attenuate, and by seven generations of their um, having value, you get about 2,000 feet plus or minus. So that really matches up pretty well with what we saw in our experimental data. And the cosmic is coming from the sky, from the sun here, well the sun's in the sky too, raining down on you, and that really kind of continues all the way to the ground, but it does attenuate because the, the, you start getting more and more air right around about Three, 4,000 feet, the air density is really increasing, and it gets attenuated and slowed down. When you put the two of them together, you end up with an area that should be kind of an equilibrium between these two points where these two bump into one another, and that's what I think I have found. <laughs> so let's look at a little bit more data so we can see if this even remotely seems Well, true. whatever the cause, 39 counts per second is still fun. The actual dose rate wasn't too bad. Let's take a look. And the gamma dose rate, and this is gamma only, was about 0 0.72, 0 0.73, somewhere in there, microsieverts per hour. Not really the worst thing on Earth. What's more interesting is to see the Geiger counter go crazy at 1,100 counts per minute. I keep my finger over the light so people don't spaz out, but most people are pretty cool with it when you take the Geiger counter on the airplane. There's no law against it. It's perfectly legal. It's perfectly okay. But you got to be sensitive because you don't want anybody to see it and, you know, freak out. Because people, people can be quite stupid these days. You know, everybody panics about everything. So make sure the person sitting beside you doesn't freak out when they see a Geiger counter. Keep your finger over the, over the light and don't set off alarms. Like, if it has an alarming feature, don't, don't let the alarming feature have any possibility of going off, or else you're going to have to deal with that. But bringing a Geiger counter on a plane is actually a really interesting and fun thing to do. I am going to figure out whether or not the nighttime is actually any worse than the daytime. That's one thing I want to check out. But the big thing I want to check out is, of course, whether or not the sweet spot is what I think it is that between 2,000 and about somewhere between four and 6,000 feet, that there is a zone where radiation from the ground is mostly gone and radiation from space hasn't really picked up too much yet. An area where there's a very, very, very low background, which can be useful for all sorts of fun things. But anyway, we'll see in, an in another week or so after I take a few more flights. All right, over the next few months, I'm going to be taking a lot more trips and testing stuff. I'll do a lot better than I did this time. This was a very short trip. I'll be heading back out west. As you can see, I'm 
over uh, California desert right this moment. I'll be back out there in a week or two uh, for more time. I'm going for work, so I can't like you know play around all the time. But I will have some time off, and I plan to go through some national parks if I can and take some uh, uh, samples with my spectrometer. Of course, I won't take them with me. Obviously, that would be illegal. But you know, I'll take samples right then and there of the background. And here's me after a long flight. Cheers!